I guess I found it somewhere around here. It was the unsolvable equation. Yes. I remembered correctly. There's something wrong with this equation. Well, let's start by investigating a bit. Suppose that x squared equals 1. First, let's move 1 to the left-hand side. Then if we factorize the left-hand side, looks like this. The answer is already clear. The only values of x that satisfy this are plus or minus 1. In other words, the only numbers that square to 1 are plus or minus 1. But, this problem states that x is not plus or minus 1. What does that even mean? Sundaman, you're here? Metten, you came at the perfect time. It looks like another strange problem has appeared. At first glance, this equation seems unsolvable, but there's a way to solve it. Sounds great. Sundaman, does this equation look familiar to you? This is the imaginary unit i which appears in complex number calculations. Nice. A number that squares to negative 1 doesn't exist in a real number system. But what if such a number does exist? The story of complex numbers begins with this idea. Similarly, let's define j as a number that squares to positive 1. However, let's assume that j is not a real number. What? So in other words, j squares to positive 1, but it's not plus or minus 1? Can we even consider such a number? But the idea is very similar to complex numbers. By the way, when we talked about dual numbers in the past, we had a similar discussion. I wonder if he noticed that? Uh, did that really happen? Well, if you don't remember, let's just move on. Okay, try to recall this. A complex number is a number of the form a plus b i, where a and b are real numbers, and i is a number that squares to negative 1. Similarly, a split complex number is a number of the form a plus b j. Here, j is a number that squares to positive 1, but it's not a real number. Hmm, okay. Looking at it this way, it's very similar to complex numbers. That's right. It looks like there's a strange world, similar to complex numbers. Let's explore it now. This is exciting. By the way, there's one thing I want you to check. If we square negative i instead of i, it gives the same result as i squared, which is still negative 1 in the end. Oh, that's right. So negative i has the same property as i? Similarly, if we square negative j instead of j, it gives the same result as j squared. So it's also positive 1. Boom, I see. So negative j has the same property as j too. Alright, let's move on. Okay. Now, let's try calculating with split complex numbers. This is... It actually looks pretty simple. First, let's expand the parentheses using the distributive property. Multiplying 1 by 3j gives this... And multiplying 2j by 3j gives this. And here we get j squared. Since j squared equals positive 1, 6j squared is equal to 6. And 3j remains as it is. Yeah, that looks good. Up to this point, as long as we keep in mind that j squared equals positive 1, we could proceed with calculations just like with regular numbers. But from here, something strange will happen. First, let's define k equals 1 plus j. And define k bar as its conjugate. Conjugate? If I recall correctly, the complex conjugate of a complex number is obtained by flipping the sign of its imaginary part. So for split complex numbers, do we also flip the sign of the part corresponding to the imaginary part? That's exactly right. In other words, positive j is replaced with negative j. Now what happens if we multiply k by k bar? Ah, uh, k is 1 plus j, and k bar is its conjugate. Expanding this expression, we get 1 minus j squared. Since j squared equals 1, the result is 0. Well done, Zundeman. Now, take a close look at this result. Even though k and k bar are non-zero numbers, multiplying them resulted in 0. Huh, you're right. Multiplying two non-zero numbers gave zero? Split complex numbers are scary. This property of split complex numbers is a major difference from regular complex numbers. But from here, even stranger things will happen. Next, let's define the absolute value of split complex numbers. We consider a split complex number z, which is expressed using real numbers x and y like this. Oh, I see. 
complex numbers can be plotted on a plane. Similarly, let's plot the split complex number z on a plane. It looks like this. Now we define the absolute value of z as the distance from the origin. This is how it looks in an expression. That seems correct at first glance. But actually, there's a problem with this definition of absolute value. What? Let's assume we adopt this definition for now. Here we set k equals 1 plus j as before. First, what is the absolute value of k? The absolute value of k is... Since we define k as 1 plus j, we just need to calculate its absolute value. If we proceed with the calculation just like we do with complex numbers, we get this. So the answer is the square root of 2. That doesn't seem problematic. Alright, now try calculating the absolute value of the conjugate of k. Fine, I guess I have no choice. Since k bar is the conjugate of k, it becomes 1 minus j. Calculating the absolute value the same way, this also equals the square root of 2. That's right. But now let's calculate the absolute value of their product. Earlier we confirmed that multiplying k by its conjugate gives 0. That means its absolute value is 0. Therefore, the product of the absolute values of k and its conjugate is the square root of 2 times the square root of 2, which equals 2. But the absolute value of their product is 0. So that means the absolute value of the product and the product of the absolute values give different results. Yes, with this definition of absolute value, we lose an important property known as the multiplicative property of absolute values. To avoid this, we need to define absolute value differently. So, let's recall a property of complex numbers. For a complex number z, its absolute value is calculated as the square root of the product of z and its conjugate. Oh yeah, I think there was a formula like that. Now let's take this property of absolute values in complex numbers and use it to define absolute value for split complex numbers. Huh? What do you mean? Okay, let's get back to split complex numbers. Let z equals x plus yj be a split complex number. What happens when we multiply z by z bar? Uh, z is equal to x plus yj, and z bar is its conjugate. Let's expand the expression first. Since j squared equals 1, the result is x squared minus y squared. Thanks, Sundaman. Now we're all set. We define the absolute value of the split complex number z as follows. As I already explained earlier, this definition is based on the property of absolute value in complex numbers. And just as Zundelmann calculated, the product of z and its conjugate is x squared minus y squared. Here, unlike in the case of complex numbers, the sign of x squared is positive, while the sign of y squared is negative. In other words, in the definition of absolute value for split complex numbers, the signs are split into positive and negative. This is the absolute value? That's a really strange definition. By the way, I have a question. What is it? Won't the inside of the square root become negative sometimes? Oof, you got me there. Yes, in this definition of absolute value, the value inside the square root can be negative, which means the absolute value itself can be imaginary. Because of this, there are different approaches to defining absolute value for split complex numbers. One approach is to simply accept that the absolute value can be imaginary. Another approach is to take the absolute value inside the square root. That way, the value inside the square root is always non-negative. Also, we can define absolute value from the start using its squared form, or consider this squared value itself as the absolute value, so we don't have to worry about the sign. There are so many different ways to define it. In any case, these definitions of absolute value all satisfy the multiplicative property. Technically speaking, we need to be careful when imaginary numbers appear, but in this discussion let's ignore those cases. Now the really strange things start happening from here. It feels like you said the same thing earlier. First, look at this diagram. This, this is... the unit circle on the complex plane? You're right. Here complex numbers are mapped to the plane, and this is the unit circle centered at the origin with radius 1. 
Now if we express the distance from the origin using absolute value, we get this equation. Note that we square the absolute value here, also 1 squared is still 1. Then we find the equation of the unit circle here. Okay, Zundeman, try doing the same thing in the world of split complex numbers. Whoa, hold on. Hmm, yes. For now, let's start by thinking about the squared absolute value. The squared absolute value of a split complex number looks something like this. So does this have to be equal to 1? This means that the distance from the origin is 1. Excellent. This is a type of hyperbola. Let's call this the unit hyperbola. The unit circle in the world of complex numbers corresponds to the unit hyperbola in the world of split complex numbers. This feels really strange. Watch out, something's coming. What? This, this is... Uh, what was this again? This is the famous Euler's formula. I think I've heard of it before. But, what about this formula? I has been replaced with J. And the trigonometric functions have been replaced with hyperbolic functions. What are hyperbolic functions? Well, let's set that aside for now. First, let's understand what these equations mean. Euler's formula states that the real part of e to the i theta is cosine of theta, and the imaginary part is sine of theta. If we think about this on the complex plane, e to the i theta represents a point on the unit circle, and it forms the angle of theta with the positive real axis. Here, the x-coordinate is cosine of theta, and the y-coordinate is sine of theta. I'm starting to remember now. And here's another equation that appeared in the problem. This seems to be the split complex number version of Euler's formula. In e to the j theta, the components analogous to the real and imaginary parts are represented using hyperbolic functions instead of trigonometric functions. And e to the j theta corresponds to a point on the unit hyperbola, though it only covers the right half of the hyperbola. Really? I've never heard of hyperbolic functions before, so I don't really understand. By the way, in the diagram of the hyperbola, which part does theta represent as an angle? That's a short question. Actually, this theta doesn't represent a typical angle. It's better understood as an area. What are you talking about? In the left diagram, the area of this part is theta over 2. So you can interpret the angle as an area? That's a unique way to look at it. And actually in the right diagram, the area of this part is also theta over 2. Really? Theta is showing up in an unexpected place. Here the concept of angle is changing, and so is the concept of rotation. That might be true. I've been putting this off a bit, but now let's go over the definition of hyperbolic functions. Hyperbolic functions are similar to trigonometric functions. Hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine are defined like this. There are other hyperbolic functions as well. Hyperbolic functions are defined using the exponential function. That's surprisingly simple. I feel relieved. Let's look at an example of the similarities between trigonometric and hyperbolic functions. Trigonometric functions have a formula like this. This has exactly the same form as the equation of the unit circle. In other words, trigonometric functions can be used as a parametric representation of the unit circle. Similarly, hyperbolic functions have a formula like this. This has exactly the same form as the equation of the unit hyperbola. Oh, you're right. So, hyperbolic functions can be used as a parametric representation of the unit hyperbola. However, since hyperbolic cosine of theta is always positive, they actually only cover the right half of the hyperbola. They're similar to trigonometric functions, but somehow different. Hyperbolic functions are fascinating. Now, let's start the proof. To prove the split complex number version of Euler's formula, let's recall the formula for the exponential function. The exponential function can be expressed as an infinite sum, like this. This is what's called the Taylor expansion of the exponential function. Alright, Sundaman, what happens to e to the negative theta? Ha! Huh, what do you mean? Oh, we just replace theta with negative theta, right? Okay. Raising negative theta to an odd power preserves the minus sign, but raising it to an even power removes the minus sign. That's right. Then what about hyperbolic cosine of theta? 
that got difficult all of a sudden. Bye. Let's start by writing down the definition of hyperbolic cosine. Oh, this is... The sum of e to the theta and e to the negative theta is divided by 2. So that means... The odd power terms cancel out. Leaving only the even power terms. So, hyperbolic cosine of theta ends up looking like this. That's an interesting result. Now let's think about hyperbolic sine of theta in the same way. This time, e to the theta minus e to the negative theta is divided by 2. This cancels out the even power terms, leaving only the odd power terms. So hyperbolic sine of theta ends up like this. Okay, now we have everything we need. Let's compute e to the j theta. Got it. First, let's replace theta with j theta in the infinite sum formula for the exponential function. Then it looks like this. That's correct. Technically, we should define what an infinite sum means for split complex numbers. But, we won't worry about that for now. Let's just proceed with the calculations. Yes. Now, since j squared equals 1, any even power of j is also 1. That means j disappears from all the even power terms. On the other hand, for odd powers of j, 1j remains. So, in the odd power terms, 1j appears. First, let's collect only the even power terms. That gives us this result. Now only the odd power terms are left. Here we factor j out. Using our previous calculations, this part turns into hyperbolic cosine of theta. And this part turns into hyperbolic sine of theta. That completes the proof. We finally arrived at the goal. Wow, even so, I never expected there would be such a similar formula to Euler's formula. Hyperbolic functions might sound difficult, but their definitions are actually simple, and the calculations turned out to be simpler than expected. Is, is that so? Complex numbers and split complex numbers are different, yet they form somewhat similar worlds. Yes. I've heard that split complex numbers are sometimes used in physics, especially in relation to space-time. That sounds pretty complicated. Well then, take care everyone. See you later.